All right, hello everyone. My name is David Zlotnick. I'm currently a PhD pre-candidate at the University of Michigan. And I conducted this work along with my supervisor, Professor James Richard Forbes. And our work is entitled, Effect of Pendulation on an SO3-Based Attitude Estimator for Precision Pointing of an Atmospheric Balloon-Borne Platform. <clears throat> so to just decode that title a little bit, really what we're looking at is um, how the effect of pendulation or swinging motion of a balloon-borne payload and the effects of that motion on an attitude estimator. So first off, what is attitude estimation? Well, Ankit already told you, but I'll tell you again. And it's the process of estimating the orientation of a body from available measurements. Uh, so on a vehicle, we have a multitude of sensors, like a ray gyroscope, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, or a sun sensor. And attitude uh, estimation is a process of fusing uh, these measurements together to come up with an accurate attitude estimate. And this is required for the proper operation of many robotic vehicles, including spacecraft, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and many uh, balloon-borne platforms. So really, any vehicle that requires autonomous rotational maneuvers will require an attitude control and determination system. So for example, here I've shown the CanX2 nano satellite, as well as BLAST, the balloon-borne large aperture uh, submillimeter telescope. And now both of these vehicles required very accurate attitude uh, estimation algorithms. In fact, uh, BLAST uh, used the extended Kalman filter, which is a very popular attitude estimation technique. It's an optimal estimation technique. And uh, BLAST used this, uh, this technique very, uh, very effectively, and it was very successful. So before I uh, dive into really the details of my work, I'd first like to discuss well, I'd like to motivate my work by discussing um, a project that I worked on as an undergraduate at McGill University. And this is uh, MICAB, or the McGill High Altitude Balloon. So the purpose of this project was to develop a, a high atmospheric uh, balloon-borne uh, platform that would carry a microwave light source into the atmosphere. And uh, this light source would be used to calibrate uh, ground-based observatories. <clears throat> so we required an adequate attitude control system so that we could point the uh, microwave light source uh, directly at the ground-based observatory. And here is uh, the first uh, iteration of our design. Um, one of the problems we had with our, uh, with our project was our low budget. And we had a low budget uh, specifically for the attitude uh, estimation. And so um, we only could afford a low-cost inertial measurement unit, or IMU. And this unit uh, contained an accelerometer, a magnetometer, as well as a ray gyroscope. And uh, that's shown right here. <clears throat> and so with these sensors, we could use the, an EKF for attitude estimation. However, it turns out that traditional EKF techniques are difficult to apply, um, <clears throat> apply robustly with uh, poor quality sensors. And this is due to the nonlinearities associated with attitude determination, as well as non-Gaussian noise associated with the poor quality sensors. And this can lead to poor performance um, of the EKF. And this uh, motivated us to use a nonlinear SO3-based estimator, which I'll be discussing uh, later in the presentation. Another issue uh, with the IMU was with the accelerometer. Now, if we assume that the accelerometer measures the gravitational field of the Earth, we can use that for attitude determination. However, low-frequency disturbances uh, such as uh, centripetal acceleration associated with uh, pendulation can cause um, inaccurate accelerometer measurements. Um, so here I'm just going to show you a video of our launch. Yeah, you do the other uh, this is done in 2013. <clears throat> and you'll see near the end of the video the kind of motion that I'm talking about. And uh, that's my supervisor, Professor James Richard Forbes, and another student, uh, Paul Aubin. Hey, guys. Who's a master's three, student two, at uh, yeah. McGill? Okay. <clears throat> three, <laughs> three, two, one, go. Woo. See you in Eastern Stop Quebec. Job. Again, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see the kind of right, kind of pen pendulatory motion that would affect the accelerometer. Another issue with uh, attitude determination is the issue of attitude parameterizations. 
So a rotation matrix uniquely and globally defines the attitude of a rigid body. And rotation matrices belong to the special orthogonal group of rigid body rotations, denoted SO3. That is the set of all orthonormal matrices with determinant equal to plus one. Uh, however, rotation matrices aren't normally used within estimation algorithms. Usually what's done is that a rotation matrix is first parameterized, and these parameterizations are used in set. So for example, three set parameterizations have been used, such as Euler angles and Gibbs parameters. All three set parameterizations uh, have independent components. However, they have singularities, and that the rotational kinematics can become undefined at certain points. Constrained four set parameterizations have also been used, such as the unit quaternion. Unit quaternion is nice because it has no singularities. However, it's non unique, and that two quaternions define the same attitude, and this can cause some computational difficulties. So to avoid these drawbacks with attitude parameterizations, we can use the rotation matrix directly with, within the estimation algorithm. And that's what I mean when I talk about an SO3-based attitude estimator. An SO3-based attitude estimator evolves directly on the special orthogonal group, and it directly estimates uh, the rotation matrix. So this work is an investigation of the effects of pendulatory motion on a nonlinear SO3-based estimator. Uh, so to do this, we will model the balloon platform dynamics. We'll also model the IMU measurements. So we'll model the rate gyroscope, the accelerometer, and the magnetometer. We'll discuss the nonlinear SO3-based estimator, and we'll test the robustness of this estimator to pendulatory motion in the simulation. Uh, so first off, rigid body kinematics are described by Poisson's equation, uh, shown here, where CBA is a rotation matrix that maps a vector in a frame A to frame B. So if we're talking about a vehicle, frame A would be the inertial frame, and frame B would be the body frame of the vehicle. And so CBA would describe that vehicle's attitude. Um, omega is the angular velocity. And this superscript BA denotes that it's the angular velocity of frame B relative to frame A. And the subscript B uh, denotes that the angular velocity has been resolved in frame B. <clears throat> the cross operator is an operator that maps a vector in R3 to the set of 3 by 3 skew symmetric matrices. Uh, so to model uh, the balloon platform dynamics, we'll model the platform uh, itself as a rigid body, and we'll constrain that to move with a three-dimensional uh, pendulum. So to do this, we have an inertial frame, frame A. We have a frame, frame P, in red, that is associated with the pendulum. And it's uh, constrained to move with the pendulum as well. And we have a frame B, the body frame of the platform, which is located at the center of mass of the platform. <clears throat> Uh, this point O here is the connection point between the pendulum and the platform. And L um, is the position of point O relative to um, frame P. And uh, the vector Y is the position of point O relative to frame B. So these two equations up here describe the kinematics of the platform and the pendulum. The first equation, uh, Poisson's equation, it, uh, describes the kinematics of the platform. The second equation describes the kinematics of the pendulum. And then employing Lagrange's equations of motion for constrained systems, uh, we can find the equation of motion of the system, which is shown here. M is the mass matrix of the system. Uh, this vector nu contains the angular velocity of the platform and angular velocity of the pendulum. And tau non is a vector of nonlinear effects. And tau d and tau c are the disturbance torques and the control torques, respectively. Since we'll be modeling uh, the accelerometer, we'll need an expression for the acceleration uh, the linear acceleration of the platform. So to do this, we define a vector, RBA, uh, which is the position of the center of frame B relative to, uh, to the inertial frame. <clears throat> and you can see from this uh, diagram, it's just equal to L minus Y. So taking the derivative twice with respect to time, we find an expression for the uh, acceleration. And we can resolve this acceleration in frame B, and it's this expression. For this matrix, it's a rotation matrix that describes the orientation of the platform relative to the pendulum. And in the simulation, we'll also need a model of the inertial measurement unit. So the rate gyroscope measures the angular velocity, and that's equal to the true angular velocity plus some bias term plus noise associated with the rate gyroscope. The magnetometer measures the magnetic field of the Earth expressed in the body frame. And this is equal to um, the true magnetic field of the Earth expressed in the body frame, plus the noise associated with the magnetometer. <clears throat> and for the accelerometer, uh, nominally it measures the gravitational field of the Earth, 
uh, in the body frame, which is equal to the true uh, gravitational field of the Earth plus the noise associated with the accelerometer. However, we'll also consider the acceleration, uh, the linear acceleration of the platform, and we'll include this within the, acceler um, <clears throat> the accelerometer model. So the measurement is equal to the true uh, gravitational field of the Earth expressed in the body frame plus the linear acceleration of the payload and uh, the noise associated with the accelerometer. Uh, so now I'll discuss the uh, nonlinear SO3 based estimator that I uh, discussed previously. <clears throat> uh, this was first implemented um, by Mani and others in 2005, and it's described by these two equations uh, shown here, where CEA is a rotation matrix that is the estimate of the true attitude, CBA, and B hat is the estimate of the true bias B, the true gyroscope bias. So we, if we look at this first equation, um, that describes how our estimate of the attitude evolves through time. And you can see it's quite similar to Poisson's equation. In fact, it's exactly the same, except we replace the true angular velocity with the uh, measured angular velocity minus the estimated bias plus an innovation term. So it really has a prediction and a correction type structure. So if we take a look at the first two terms, that's the prediction, where we're taking our, um, our rate gyroscope measurement, we're subtracting what we think the bias is, and we're using that to propagate our estimate of the rotation matrix. And then the correction comes in the form of the innovation sigma. Um, and that's what's going to drive um, our estimate towards uh, the true attitude. <clears throat> so really the trick is picking a sigma, which will do this, which will drive CEA towards CBA. And uh, the bias evolves, uh, evolves according to this equation. Uh, it's a simple equation minus a gain k sub i over another gain k multiplied by the innovation. So again, the trick, we need to pick sigma in such a way that CEA approaches to CBA. And the way that Mani and others do this is they pick uh, this innovation, which is equal to minus a gain k multiplied by this expression. So these two vectors, g sub e and m sub e, are the um, <clears throat> measurements that we expect to get based on our estimate of the rotation matrix. So if you look, um, the innovation is really based on the cross product of what we expect our measurement to be, um, and we cross product that with um, the true measurement. So when our expected measurement lines up with the true measurement, <clears throat> the cross product is zero, and the innovation is zero, and that indicates that we have arrived at the true attitude. <clears throat> These gains, k sub g and k sub m, can be tuned. Uh, typically, they're chosen based on the relative confidence of the accelerometer and the magnetometer. So if we're more confident in the accelerometer, we can just bump up that gain, k sub g. And if we're less confident, we can reduce it. <clears throat> so now to discuss the dynamic model of the platform, uh, the IMU measurements, and the estimator, I'll now discuss uh, the proportional and derivative type control law that we used um, for the MICAP project. It's just a simple uh, PD law. This first term is the proportional control. Second term is the derivative control. <clears throat> and this angle, theta hat 3, is the estimated yaw angle uh, that has been extracted from the estimated rotation matrix. And uh, omega y3 is the third component of the, angular, the measured angular velocity. And b hat 3 is the third component of the estimated bias. And these are just uh, the proportional gain and the uh, derivative gain. So it's quite a simple uh, control law. Um, this is a, a, a ground test of the attitude control and uh, determination system. And so they're going to give it a uh, disturbance, and you'll see that the platform will reorient itself uh, towards the step and increase the filter length. It's a little hard to see in this video, but the actuator on board is a DC motor uh, with a flywheel attached. It's a reaction wheel. Uh, well, it's actually pretty impressive. That I, like, look at it. <laughs> My supervisor yeah, is perfectly it parallel to where it started. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so now um, we'll test um, 
the robustness of this estimator and the control law to um, pendulatory motion in a simulation. Um, so the simulation parameters are shown here. More parameters are uh, described in the paper. The initial um, angular velocity of the platform is described by this equation. Second, uh, sorry, the angular uh, velocity associated with the pendulum is zero. And the initial attitude um, associated with the, uh, the platform or the payload is just a 20 degrees um, through, the yaw, through the yaw axis. And the initial attitude of the pendulum is described by this equation. And that corresponds to just a five degree uh, rotation off uh, the vertical. So we're really just taking the platform, rotating it 20 degrees, and then rotating the pendulum five degrees off the vertical, letting go, and we'll see uh, how the estimator uh, performs. We also disturb um, uh, the platform using uh, disturbance data that we got from, from a preliminary flight. And for the estimator, we'll, have, uh, we'll pick the overall estimator gain, k, to be equal to 5. In the first simulation, we'll set the two gains associated with the accelerometer and the, and the magnetometer to be equal. We'll set that to 1. And in the second simulation, um, we'll reduce the gain associated with the accelerometer because uh, we'll, I'll explain that in a bit. So this is the plot of the trace of a rotation matrix CBE. CBE is equal to CBA times CEA transpose, and it's a representation of the error uh, in the attitude estimate. So when the true attitude is equal to the estimated attitude, CBE is equal to the identity matrix, and the trace is 3. In this first plot, um, <clears throat> the blue line is um, is uh, the accelerometer model where we haven't included the linear acceleration. So you can see that it performs very well and uh, gets to three. <clears throat> the, red, uh, the red plot, sorry. The red plot is um, the acceler accelerometer model where we've included the uh, linear acceler acceleration of the platform. And you can see that that pendulatory motion causes significant steady state errors. And I think this plot is more, uh, more revealing <clears throat> plots the yaw, pitch, and roll angles, the, the errors between those angles, between the estimated attitude and the true attitude. And you can really see that including that acceleration due to pendulation really bumps up that steady state error. <clears throat> and it's the same case with the bias. So here I plotted the norm of the true bias and the estimated bias. And you can really see that um, <clears throat> pendulation causes uh, significant errors in that case as well. So in an effort to uh, mitigate the effects of acceleration, um, linear acceleration of the payload due to pendulation, what we can do is we can just reduce the gain associated with the accelerometer. And that way, we're reducing our confidence in that measurement. <clears throat> and as you can see, the red line, where we've included the acceleration due to pendulation, <clears throat> it's, it's much more closer to the model where we haven't included uh, acceleration due to pendulation. And uh, here is, again, the yaw, pitch, and roll errors. And again, including the acceleration due to pendulation, it's much closer um, <clears throat> to, the, uh, to, the more, to the better model. And again, the bias, the error in the bias, uh, it's much closer. So um, a few closing remarks. Uh, we've investigated the effects of pendulation on a nonlinear SO3-based uh, estimator. Uh, we derived a dynamic model of the Bloomborn platform, and we included that acceleration of the platform into the accelerometer measurement. <clears throat> we discovered that the effects of oscillation can be mitigated by just reducing that estimator gain associated with the accelerometer. Well, now you might be thinking, okay, now we're just um, shifting uh, more of that estimator load to the magnetometer, and you're right. And obviously, this is not ideal, as the magnetometer um, can be unreliable, especially if you have all those electronics in the payload. It can be really unreliable, so this is not ideal. So really, in the future, what we'd like to do is include, uh, we'll develop an estimator that directly takes the acceleration into account. So somehow, maybe estimate that acceleration due to pendulation and work that into the uh, estimator uh, so we can get around that issue. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know there's a question about the PD control law, so maybe <laughs> you'd like to go first. Yes. No, David, thank you. I, I was just curious whether you're, you or, or the professor is thinking about doing something 
other than a PD control law, something of higher order, for example. So you would focus on um, you know, robustness issues like a, a gain over a working band. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so really, like, issues. so the, <laughs> the reason that we did a PD control law was because it's really easy to tune. And then the electrical guys that are actually working with the equipment, they can see you know, how if I bump this gain up, um, how is that going to affect the control? And really, like this, this term, I do not like. It's pretty bad. Any, uh, any uh, noise included in the rate gyro measurement is going to be amplified. So really, um, I like to put like a low-pass filter in there. Okay. That'll be better. So, and you can do, do like any kind of um, classical uh, control techniques, like shaping, loop shaping, uh, gain scheduling. And maybe uh, in the future, we'd like to include an optimal control technique, like LQR. Something in that. <laughs> you don't like that? Any any you control know. algorithms that you'd that you'd like to suggest? Uh, I I can email you some sure. stuff. Some yeah, that'd be nice. Stuff, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Help me understand where this fits in in terms of um, to actually be practically being able to do attitude control, like you're saying for the application that you're talking about. Where, where, do you, where does this stand? How much more work or effort needs to be done? I mean, a lot of this is kind of theoretical work, so there's probably some experimental work that needs to be done. But I'm trying to get an idea since I'm not, I, mean, I don't understand and know your field well enough to know where does this fit into how much more work needs to be done for this to be actually practically applied to a high altitude balloon and being able to point at a ground station like you were talking about. Um, Quite a lot more work I'd expect, um, especially because we actually, the payload that I showed you, we actually lost that. Uh, so we lost that payload. So really, um, moving forward, uh, we'd like to get experimental data and do some tests. Um, well, really what I would like to do is I would um, really like to get the ground truth of the, uh, the payload using a motion capture system. And we can compare that to the estimator, and we can really see how it's performing, not just in a simulation, because that's not really telling me much about reality. So that's what I would like to see. And then, and then we could get some idea of how it's going to perform in the air. So I hope that answered your question. Any others? Yeah. So, so David, last year, I guess, Chloe spoke about this project as well, some of the preliminary things. And as you mentioned at the beginning, the idea is to provide a, um, a calibrating light source. Right, a calibrating microwave source. Yeah. And how close are you to? getting to that point to, to, to try that? Well, like I mentioned, we actually lost the payload. And unfortunately, a lot of people involved in this project um, graduated from McGill, and they've moved on, and including my supervisor, Professor James. Who's, he was in charge of the project. He was at McGill, and he's moved to Michigan. So it's kind of, we're kind of stuck on this. I mean, at the moment, I don't believe anybody's even working on it. So are you going to kind of do an alternative project, or just? Well, I'd like to bring this to Michigan and maybe get some of the balloon guys over there. I haven't talked to them yet, but I'd like to do that. 